that throughout Petra's life, she has been raised by her parents or her teachers or friends around her, her early caregivers, to seek approval and safety from outside of herself, to look to others to provide those much needed um, resources, which a stride we learn from generating within. Welcome to the 1000 Day Sober Podcast. My name is Lee Davey. I am not an alcoholic. I refuse to be anonymous. I am someone that doesn't drink alcohol and I spend every waking moment helping other people do the same. Like right now, 9 a.m. Monday morning, 9th of January, my two girls are asleep. Both of them got jet lagged. They spent Christmas in Los Angeles. I couldn't join them, unfortunately. Uh, because they still won't let me in the country. Um, so we spent Christmas apart for the first time. And um, it was really difficult, actually. And there was, um, you know, I'm sure those of you, I mean, here's, here's what I always uh, experience when, when I'm away from my family. There, there's, there's an upside and a downside, right? So the upside is, when you are a husband and when you are a father, there's a lot of time and energy uh, taken up in those roles that when you're not needed to apply that energy into those roles, you can actually apply it in other areas. And there is a sense of freedom that comes with that. The, you know, you wake up in the morning and you don't have to play with your children or you don't have to show up in any way for your wife. All of a sudden, the day is the day is your oyster and you can do whatever you want. And, and I, I really feel that to build stronger relationships uh, with those you love, actually carving out time for yourself. And I don't mean I'm going to have the night off tonight. That's part of it but I'm going to go away for two weeks on my own. I think that's a really healthy um, thing to introduce into relationships. Uh, but then at some time, obviously, I miss them. And um, I found that being a dad and being a husband, for me anyway, it's become part of my structure. And and we've had it. I, I, can, uh, I can waver a little bit. I mean, I was sick as well. And Sickness always saps your motivation, right? Um, but yeah, I really needed them back. So they're back, and uh, it's good to be a dad again, and it's good to be a husband again. But for those of you who are really struggling out there to get connected in your relationship, talk to each other about trying to find space for a couple of weeks to go away on your own and to learn to uh, love yourself, be with yourself, learn. Uh, to be with it, peace, silence, um, and it, it could really help, honestly. So what am I going to talk about today? I'm going to talk a little bit about people like us do things like this. And um, people like us do things like this is a quote from Seth Godin. Seth Godin, I mean, how do you explain who Seth Godin is? I just call him a marketing genius, but he's much more than that. Um, you can Google him. Uh, he has a very, very good blog. He sends a blog out every day, very short to read, full of real good life hacks. Um, and he also has a great podcast called Akimbo. So check him out. An amazing resource for life. A wonderful, inspirational man. And one of his quotes is, people like us do things like this. And he's saying essentially that when you're uh, in a business and you're thinking about marketing, you need to understand that status is really important for people, right? Like people subconsciously make decisions based on what it is, based on the perceived rule book, right? Like they, they look around them in the culture that they are embedded in and subconsciously there are rule sets around how we are supposed to behave when we are in and around this culture, right? And knowing and understanding that as a marketer allows you then to create uh, value um, because you truly understand the mechanisms of the wants and the desires and the needs of people because you understand that people like us do things like this, right? I'll give you an example. I was 
listening to the Alex Huberman podcast on my way to Heathrow to pick the girls up from LA. And he was interviewing Jocko Willink, right? And Jocko Willink, for those of you who don't know, is a former Navy SEAL who is, a, is an influencer today, right? He, he runs companies working in leadership. He's got a podcast. Uh, he's been on the Joe Rogan podcast, uh, Tim Ferriss podcast. Um, and he was talking to Alex Huberman. And the conversation switched to alcohol, right? And Jocko was saying that unlike most of us who look around in society and end up drinking alcohol because people like us do things like this, like everybody around us drinks alcohol, Jocko actually escaped that. So as Jocko grew up, he actually looked at alcohol and thought, this is pretty stupid. Like, I I'm not going to drink alcohol. I'm not going to take drugs. And he was pretty straight laced until his early 20s when he joined the Navy SEALs. And he said on a podcast with Huberman that when he joined the Navy SEALs, um, he quickly learned that alcohol and the use of alcohol and drinking a lot of it was part of the Navy SEAL culture, a big part of the Navy SEAL culture. And so people like us do things like this. Navy SEALs drink a lot of alcohol. It's part of the culture, right? And Joko didn't spend uh, a lot of time going into the deep dive, but he just said, well, you know, I'm here, I'm in the Navy SEALs, um, it's no real big deal to me. I see that everybody drinks, so I'm like, okay, let's give this a go. So he goes in there as someone who doesn't drink, and he sees that the culture is a drinking culture, so he joins that culture. He does the same as everybody else. People like us do things like this. And I would love to be able to speak to him about that at some point, okay? He actually talked a little bit about his regret in not being more mindful around that decision, um, given now that he's left the Navy SEALs and he can see the harm and the damage that alcohol has uh, created in many of the people's lives that he loves and respects and is inspired by. Um, so it is a, a, a good little podcast. There's a, quite a lot of talk about alcohol in there, so it's really interesting. Um, but that's where I want to start, right? Jocko... Um, may not have thought about this in, in great detail, but he joins the Navy SEALs and he sees that everybody else is drinking. Um, and there's a status thing going on here, right? Like status is really big when it comes to being someone who doesn't drink alcohol. We really need to be aware that one of the core reasons that we drink is to keep us safe. Uh, and the reason it keeps us safe is because it's, either increases or maintains our status quo, right? And in some cases, it can decrease our status, which can be beneficial to us and keep us safe because people notice us. Now imagine somebody who is really life is going to shit um, and alcohol is a big part of that demise. Uh, the more they drink, the lower their status goes, the more likely their family and friends are like to step up and try to help them and love them and care for them because their life is spiraling out of control. That is an example of a decrease in status being effective and keeping that person safe. If you are drinking in a group and drinking is one of the core ways that you socialize, to continue to drink maintains that status quo. And if you go into a group of people like Jocko did, and those people are drinking, then by drinking with them and drinking as heavily as them or drinking more than them and incorporating that whole kind of like male, masculine kind of like drinking culture, then you are increasing your status within the group. Imagine someone going to the Navy SEALs and, and being straight laced saying, I'm not drinking. It doesn't take a genius to consider uh, or perceive that status could be lowered in that environment, right? So people like us do things like the, uh, people like us do things like this is a really important thing to reflect upon and understand and a riddle to unravel if you want to be someone who doesn't drink alcohol. So take Petra as an example. So Petra is trying to be someone who doesn't drink alcohol. She's doing as much as she can, right? She joins Strive. She immerses herself into the community. She listens to the Strive method, audio assignments, watches the videos, 
uh, and takes action and she is doing her very best to be someone just drink alcohol. Uh, she, her husband knows what she's doing, but it took a long time for her to tell him. Um, Strive is still a little bit of a secret. Like, you know, she hasn't opened up completely about everything that she does on there. Uh, and a few close friends know that she's trying to give up drinking, but they don't know anything about Strive, right? And then she starts a new job and she's really super nervous and super overwhelmed because it's new. And she doesn't really know what to expect, right? She is not experienced in the role that she's going into. And people like us do things like this. So people where she works, she has a perception they're going to be really great and experienced at what they do, and she is not. So she's already going into work with a perceived lower status than everybody else, and that is uncomfortable for her parts, parts of her personality uh, the former ego that are, that are designed and have one task, and that's to keep her safe. So she goes into this new job. She's overwhelmed. She's anxious and she's stressed. All triggers that in the past used to accumulate in her choosing to drink alcohol to keep her safe, right? So what is happening there? She's going in. She's feeling anxious and overwhelmed. And her protective parts of her subpersonality, her ego, they don't want her to feel anxious, stressed, and overwhelmed. So they say, okay, let's drink quickly and let's drink fast so we can remove the feelings of anxiety, overwhelm, and stress, okay? So when she goes into this environment and she's already feeling that, her parts are already setting off a conversation internally saying, let's drink to get rid of this anxiety, stress. And if she hasn't worked on um, how to be in, how to transfer from a parts uh, driven state, which drives you what we call below the line in stripe, to a self-led state, which is above the line, where that beautiful part of you that knows that you've got it, like that part of you that is way, way comfortable with feeling anxious and stressed and overwhelmed because it knows, this innate wisdom within you that knows that you can handle it. It's not, it's not a big deal. If you are not used to um, switching and regulating into that state, then it is a new job like this one that Petra starts could easily uh, drift you into choosing to drink before you've even gone into uh, the new the new job, right? But let's say she's white knuckled away through it, or she has used her skills and her new sense of embodiment to actually get into self and to prepare herself to go to work the next day, and she's okay. But then she gets there, and everybody's talking about alcohol. Everyone's talking about how much wine they drank. Everybody's asking her what her favorite drink is. They're asking her what her favorite pub is. They're, they always go out on a Friday after they finish, and they're asking Petra, are you going to come out with us on Friday to the Holly Bush where we all meet up and we have this drinking game that we're playing? And all of a sudden, Petra's parts start playing the status game. They start to feel uncomfortable and awkward. It's like, look, I'm already new here. I'm already at the lowest status rank because I'm new. Um, I don't really know what I'm doing, so I feel anxious, uncomfortable. I really need these people to like me and to support me because, A, I don't know what I'm doing, and, B, I really don't like the feelings that I have when I'm lonely and I'm isolated. I need to be a part of a tribe, and these all drink alcohol, right? So in that moment, Petra is facing what I would say is one of the critical moments in learning to be someone who doesn't drink alcohol. She has an opportunity to step up and um, say people like us, I me, do things like this, i.e. not drink, and really set a clear boundary and really start talking truth and authenticity straight from the off, which allows self to be present more often, or she can start by feeling shame about her decision to be someone that doesn't drink alcohol. And she can choose in that moment to join the group, to not speak her truth, to be inauthentic, to hold back and to lie or to just bend the story and the narrative so it fits people like us 
these people in her new job, do things like this, drink alcohol, as part of her narrative as well, right? And that will lead to her either drinking with them or it will lead to her making excuses to avoid drinking scenarios. So like, I can't go out Friday because I'm taking antibiotics and I, and, or I can't go out Friday because I have to go somewhere early Saturday morning, a good examples of excuses of not to drink. Or she worries so much about this status gig. She worries so much about really the shame of being, being, trying to be sober, right? She worries so much about that that it creates anxiety, overwhelm, and then her parts say, oh, there's anxiety, there's overwhelm, we really need to drink alcohol right now. You see how important this is at this moment? It's massive, right? And Petra can't tell him the truth because she's overwhelmed with shame. So why is that? Like, where is that shame coming from? Well, a mentor of mine, Preston Smiles, who's going to be a guest on this podcast in February, he once taught me that um, all the actions we take in the world either come from uh, a desire for approval or a desire to feel safe. And if, and invariably, we're designed to look outside of ourselves uh, for those things. Well, actually, we're designed to approve of ourselves and we're designed to feel safe, but our exposure to societal conditioning and our culture um, drives us to seek approval from outside of ourselves and seek safety from outside of ourselves. And if we don't get those things, we feel super uncomfortable and our parts kick in and try to control, which is the third element, approval, security, and control. Our parts try to control our approval and our security uh, through dysfunctional behaviors and habits. Um, and when we are looking outside of ourselves for our approval, security, and control, we are living an outside in existence, a to me existence. And that drags us below the line into a state of victim consciousness and drama where alcohol use is prevalent. Okay. Um, at Strive, we teach people to live an inside out experience, a by me lifestyle where approval, security, and control is generated from within, and we do not rely on it from outside of ourselves. So where does approval, security, and control fit into Petra's example here, right? Well, we could say that Petra has uh, an approval issue. Petra doesn't have um, strong stores of self-esteem, and she does not approve of herself as strongly as she could do, okay? And then because she's moving into a new job and people like us do things like this, like they all drink and they all are in a tribe that she's just joining anew, she feels a real strong push by her part, her ego, right, her inner children, uh, to seek approval from these other people. And if part of this approval is drinking alcohol with them, okay, then her parts will push for that, especially if her parts have used alcohol as a way to gain approval in the past. Like it is just a subconscious behavior, okay? So what she's doing is she goes into a new environment and she feels like she needs approval from these people, um, but she's worried she's not going to get it if she doesn't drink. So she takes control by choosing to drink, okay? So she uses control. She manipulates her environment by drinking alcohol, something she doesn't want to do to fit into the tribe, okay? There's also an element of safety here or security. So if her new workmates don't approve of her, she will feel unsafe. So she drinks alcohol to take control of that situation. And when she drinks alcohol with her friends, she feels safe. Uh, because she feels approved of. So there's an element of safety there as well. So I would say that throughout Petra's life, she has been raised by her parents or her teachers or friends around her, um, her early caregivers, to seek approval and safety from outside of herself, to look to others to provide those much-needed 
um, resources, which at Stride we learn from generating within. You know, like right now in this moment, you know, I, I prove myself. Like I, I feel like I, I'm, I woke up this morning and my goal is to be the best human being I could be today. You know, so I prove of myself. And right now I'm safe. Like uh, I have a roof over my head. Um, nobody's going to break in here right now and cause me harm. Um, I feel safe in my relationships. Um, like I feel financially safe. There is no way that my current financial situation can harm me right now as I'm talking to you. So I feel safe. And I feel in control of everything that I can control right now in this moment. And the things that I can't control right now in this moment, like the tree outside of my house just suddenly being struck by lightning and crashing down on my house, um, I can handle that, right? Like I, I can handle the fact that I don't control it. So, you know, I and you, I ask yourself the sort of same questions. Do you right now in this moment, without fast forwarding into the future or thinking about the past, right now in this moment, do you prove of yourself? Are you doing the best you can? Right now in this moment, do you feel safe? Are you safe right now in this moment? And are you in control right now of the things you can control? And are you willing to let go of the things that you can't right now in this moment? And very often the question is, the answer is yes. Yeah, I do improve myself right now. I do feel safe right now. And I do feel in control right now. It's whizzing back and forth into the future and the past that creates anxiety, overwhelm, and stress that activates this desire to get that approval, security, control of outside of ourselves, which is why we really encourage it at Strive of really spending a lot of time uh, reflecting and being alone and getting in tune with self and learning to love and approve and feel safe within yourself, right? So let me give you a different story to Petra, a counter story. So when I became someone who doesn't drink alcohol, I remember one of my uh, biggest challenges was um, on the, the weekend that I'd stopped drinking, there was a big poker tournament in Nancy Mall Rugby Club. So we were going to go to the rugby club at uh, 12 o'clock, and the plan was to drink all day and play poker all day for the next 12 hours plus, right? And obviously, I had then taken this decision to stop drinking. And I hadn't told anybody, really, that, that I was going to do it. It was just, I was reading this book. I hadn't really told anyone about it. And then here, here I was. I'd stopped drinking, say, on the Friday. And Sunday, I was going to go to this poker tournament. So um, I'd already taken the vow. I'd already taken the fundamental choice to change the orientation in my life and to be sober, to be someone who doesn't drink alcohol. And that was cast iron. I'd already made that vow. That, that is a really important piece, by the way. Like if, if you keep flitting in and out of, I don't know if I'm going to be able to stop drinking forever. I don't know if I can do this. I don't know if this is what I want. Maybe I just want to stop drinking in Monday, Friday and just drink on the weekends. Maybe I just want to stop drinking when I'm alone. Like if you're in that ambivalent state of being, your parts who have relied on you to drink alcohol and keep you safe for so long will always win, right? To get self in charge more, help self out by making a definitive decision. My decision was I'm never going to drink again. And it was super powerful for me. If that, if you have a narrative in your mind driven by your parts, that that is too much for you and you don't want to take that on right now, then we have a quest at Strive where you just stop drinking for 30 days or you stop drinking in 60 days, or you stop drinking in 90 days, and you put everything into making that a success. So, so I was doing this, right? Like I'm making that fundamental choice. I am never going to drink again. I go into Nantimo Rugby Club on the Sunday, and what happens in, in Ogmo Vale, where I grew up, is invariably you would find four or five friends, um, and you would go into what was called a round, right? So let's say five of us would decide to go in a round then what would happen was i would go up and buy the round first so i would buy five pints and then when one of us had drunk everybody had to knock their pint back then so you're always going at the pace of the quickest drinker which is torture but we we somehow perceived it to be fun and then when you had your five pints so every every person in the group bought a pint you would then have another five. So then you would have 10 pints and that's how it would work. So people were coming up to me and saying, hey, do you want to go on a round? Do you want to go on a round? 
And I'm like, no, I'm not drinking. And they're like, oh, yeah, what's wrong with you? So whenever you say you're not drinking, the first question someone says is what's wrong with you, right? Um, and this is, this is really part of the shame, right? So what's wrong with you? Well, we don't want to feel like there's something wrong with us. There will be uh, parts of us, our subpersonality, our ego, uh, that when they were very young were made to feel really, really uncomfortable um, about being different to everybody else, right? And if in the UK, particularly in our UK culture, if you don't drink, then people like us do things like this, right? You're, you're not in the tribe. You're not in the, um, the main group. So it's like, hey, what's wrong with you? When, of course, you could choose if you want a different paradigm and to look at that and actually say, well, what's wrong with, what's wrong with you because you're drinking? What's wrong with this culture that we're drinking? What's wrong with this culture that something like MDMA or ecstasy, which can, you know, really transform your state and make you feel such love, right? Why is that illegal? And drinking alcohol where, you know, yesterday as I walked through Cardiff Town Centre before Cardiff City played Leeds, there was more police than you would find, um, you know, in a war zone uh, because they're expecting everybody to get drunk and fight. Why is that legal? And <laughs> Why is uh, MDMA or ecstasy not legal, for example, right, here in the UK? You could get into that tribe if you want, right? You, if you want to, but but there is this people like us do things like this. This is a status issue. Um, but here's the thing: uh, when I was young, I was always um, different. I was the only non-white guy um, in my community, and um, people used to call me a chink. Um, I was also English, living in Wales. So people used to call me an, uh, an English fucker, right? Um, and an English bastard. And so I kind of grew up in a really dysfunctional way, um, needing the approval of other people, actually, because um, I assumed that people just hated me and there was something wrong with me. But there was an, an inner rebel as well. It was like, I'm, I'm, I kind of like being different. You know, there was, there was something about being different, you know, something about that elevated my status a little bit, you know. Um, and I used that. So when I went into an animal rugby club and everyone's like, why aren't you drinking? Uh, what's wrong with you? I'm like, there's nothing wrong with me. And I remember the first person said to me, there's nothing wrong with you. What, you're just not drinking today? I'm like, no, I'm never drinking again. You're never drinking again? Why? And now here's a really important thing. I just said, I'm never drinking again because my marriage is falling apart. Me and Debbie are arguing all the time. I just can't control the situation. I don't like who I'm becoming when I've had a drink. And when I have a drink, I can't stop shouting and screaming and getting into the, the, the whole cycle of destruction. And I'm really worried, man. I'm really worried that I'm going to lose her. I'm really worried that she's, Jude's getting older. He's getting more exposed to this. I can't live like this anymore. So I'm fucking done. I ain't drinking again. Oh, and how do you feel? Well, it's my first weekend, but I'm really excited. And I'm really looking forward to it. And, um, yeah, I can't wait to bring it on. I, I stopped smoking like 10 years ago and, and that was something that everybody said I couldn't do and I did it and I, and I think I can do this as well. And I'm really looking forward to it. And you know what? I said that to every single person who come and sat down next to me. Not one person ridiculed me. Not one person fueled the shame. Not one person poked fun at me. Every single person met me with curiosity. I had more people saying to me, hey, do you know what? I really admire what you're doing. I wish I had the balls to do what you're doing. You know, I don't have a drinking issue. Always oh, starts like that, right? I don't have a drinking issue, but there are times where I wish I could, didn't drink as much, right? And this is in a rugby club. Like this, this, is, this is my equivalent of Jocko Willink's Navy SEALs. Like I'm in a rugby club where the, the, the club exists just to drink alcohol. And one by one, everybody comes up to me and just says, like, wow, you are like doing an amazing thing. And I haven't had, I haven't had a drink for like way over a decade. And I have always been open and honest with everybody about my decision to be someone who doesn't drink alcohol. I've always chosen to walk into a room full of pride and wanted to tell my story. And I have never had anybody um, ridicule me or poke fun at it. I, I, I've had people ask questions and become curious and those 
those conversations can sometimes lead to debates. But I've never had anybody ridicule me or poke fun at me. What I'm saying is, for me, my experience is the perception that I feel shame and that I will lose status as a result of the shame has just not manifested for me, right? Now, have I, um, have I exited certain tribes and certain groups? Yes, I have. Does that mean that I feel really bad? Like, did I lose my friendship groups because of the loss in status and they ousted me because I don't drink alcohol anymore? No, I made a choice to leave certain groups and tribes because people like me, people like us do things like this. I had made a vow that I would want to be someone that doesn't drink alcohol. And I quickly learned that it was um, a much more connected experience if I spent time with people who didn't drink alcohol. Now, I have friends who drink alcohol, but when we're together, they don't drink alcohol. Like, the alcohol is not their first concern. Their first concern is connecting with me, right, and being a friend. And I, I do not hang around with friends who are drinking copious amounts of alcohol. But the first goal for them is drinking alcohol. OK, um, is it difficult to find new friendship groups? Of course it is. Right. Of course it is. Um, but there's also an excitement uh, in, in that process. It doesn't have to be arduous. It doesn't have to be terrifying. It can be a really um, educational learning and growth and development process of finding out who you are and then emanating that energy to attract like minded people. It's incredible. Strive is like that, right? Like everybody at Strive, we're a digital um, community, but everybody at Strive is trying to be someone who doesn't drink alcohol and live consciously. And therefore, we can all show up and be really authentic and really connect. If we all live together, what an amazing experience that would be, right? So I use that rebel in a way. And a lot of you will be saying, yeah, well, there's a rebel inside of me that drinks. I don't want to drink, but then this rebel comes up and says, no, fuck you and your sober journey. I want you to drink alcohol. Okay, well, use that. Re- to have a chat with that rebel because drinking alcohol is, is not being a rebel. Everybody drinks fucking alcohol. Drinking alcohol is like taking the easy way out. Like if you want to, if you want to harness the power of your inner rebel, then create a new tribe of people like us do things like this. Be really proud of your decision to be someone that doesn't drink alcohol. Be really proud that you are taking a stand for yourself, that you're taking a stand for your children, that you're taking a stand for your partners, right? That you are doing this not just for you, but the emanation of your vibration, the energy that you're going to transmute as someone who doesn't drink alcohol could actually be generational. Like you are showing your child that you do not have to play this people like us do things like this status game. You do not have to drink alcohol and take your approval of everybody else just because everybody else drinks alcohol. You don't have to jo- join the Navy SEALs and drink alcohol because every other Navy SEAL drinks alcohol. You don't have to go to the rugby club and drink alcohol because everybody else at the rugby club drinks alcohol. You are making a stand and choosing a different way, which allows your children to go, oh, yeah, right, okay. Maybe I don't have to do this because my parents don't do this, right? That is super powerful, super powerful. So the rebel, use it, but use it in a different way to be someone who doesn't drink alcohol, okay? So the shame thing, like how do we deal with the shame? When we walk into a room and people are this new job that Petra's got and people are saying, hey, 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 we're going to go out drinking. And the shame of like, I don't drink. Like, how do we deal with that? Well, Brenny Brown's the master on shame. And Brenny Brown says to dissolve shame, you've got to talk about it. How do you talk about it? Well, you've got to be vulnerable. And how do you be vulnerable? Practice and embodiment. All right? Practice and embodiment. It's almost like Susan Jefferson, feel the fear and do it anyway. Yesterday, you know, me, Eliza, and Zia went to a trampoline park. And we got there and Zia sees so many people there jumping up and down. She starts crying. She says, I don't want to do this. I don't want to do this, Dad. I don't want to do this. But I know at the other end of this fear block, the other end of these parts that want to keep us safe by not 
going in there and jumping around people and doing something she's never done before, right? The other, the other side of that is excitement and enjoyment. We just got to help her get over the hump. We just got to help her to be super brave and super courageous, right? And so I just get down on a level and I'm just like, okay, what's really going on for you? You know, what's really going on for you? Well, there's just so many people here. What if I can't do this? What if I look stupid, right? It's inviting that vulnerability. I practice vulnerability through journaling, through talking to myself, through talking to people that I trust. And I take the rule that I trust everybody until they give me a reason not to. And it hasn't tripped me up so far. I'm a great believer that this feeling and this thought that I can only be open and transparent to certain people because they'll use it against me is bullshit parts talking as resistance just to stop you doing it to keep you small. Okay. So vulnerability smashes shame. Talking about it smashes it. To just go into a rugby club or in Petra State, go into work new work environment and say, I yeah, I don't drink I don't drink alcohol and here are the reasons why I don't. Incredibly powerful. You are in a, in that moment being a leader. And at Strive, we build quests to help you do this. Right? We build quests to help you do this. Because listening to this podcast. And coming away with some light bulbs, intellectually going, yeah, I get it. Oh, wow, I can see how status is impacting my game. I can see how approval security control is keeping me drinking. I can see what Lee's saying. That's getting it intellectually. But how do you embody it? How do you embody that knowledge so you are vulnerable, so you feel pride, not shame, so you're talking your truth, so you're being authentic, so you're being someone who doesn't drink alcohol? How do you do that? While at Strive, we build quests. We say, hey, this is what we want you to do every day for the next 30 days. Do you want to do it? Do you want to step up? Can you see how being someone that doesn't drink alcohol is much more than stopping drinking alcohol? In Petra's example and my example in a rugby club, it has nothing to do with alcohol. It all has to do with shame. It all has to do with approval, security, and control. It all has to do with a lack of vulnerability. It all has to do with internal story making. It all has to do with inner child fears. It all has to do with our ego. And that is the work that we do at Strive. Come join us. And if you don't want to, find a group. Find some way, somehow, therapist, coach, whatever, to work on the root cause issues that are driving you to drink alcohol. I'm telling you, you'll find Somewhere along the line, you'll have a status issue. People like us do things like this. My advice to every single one of you who is on this journey, who has taken the vow, the fundamental choice to be someone who doesn't drink alcohol, is to make a declaration to yourself, a vow to yourself, that every single person that matters to you, you're going to tell them what you're going to do. You're going to tell your wives, your husbands, your kids, your people at work, your friends. You're going to say, hey, I've decided I'm going to be someone who doesn't drink alcohol. I'm not going to drink alcohol. And here are the reasons why I'm not going to drink alcohol, right? Like, just tell them. So, that, so there's, there's no, like, there's no surprise. There's no room for your part to go, oh, we had to drink last night because Auntie Deirdre came around and we hadn't told her that we weren't drinking and she brought a bottle of wine and she offered it to us. And in that moment, we felt stupid and ashamed and small and like she would judge us who we drank. Remove it, get ahead of it, plan ahead and just tell people, right? Particularly you guys out there who are worried about telling your guys, right? You're worried about telling them. And and part of the worry is um, not just telling them that you want to be someone that doesn't drink alcohol. The biggest worry is everybody out there is worried they'll fail. So, like, they're worried that if I tell my friend that I am going to stop drinking and then I fail and they see that I'm drinking, then I'm going to lose status. Well, just explain to them that, hey, I've decided that I'm going to be someone that doesn't drink alcohol. This is how you can support me. And because I need my friends now more than ever. And part of this journey, you know, there may be times where I really struggle and drink. But that doesn't mean that my goal has changed. It just means that for whatever reason, I struggled 
is something. I wasn't able to deal with it. I drank as a result of dealing with it. And now I need to look at that and I need to test, tweak and polish and pivot, right? Just be very clear and open to them about the journey so they can understand it more, right? Um, I know that this is very confronting and very fearful and very challenging for so many of you listening to this, but I won't beat around the bush. You have the power, you have the roadmap, you have the knowledge, you have the understanding, you have the strength, you have the courage, you have uh, the compassion, you have the confidence. It is all within you. You all have it. There is none of you where I could say, oh, you shouldn't do this. You can't. You all can do this. Okay. You can all can do this. And just like Zia yesterday at the trampoline park, you know, sometimes you've just got to get on there and start jumping. You've just got to get in there and do it and get involved. Get out of the arena and, and get out of the stands and get into the arena, as Bernie Brown says, right? So I'll leave on this. If you want to be someone just drink alcohol and you find that the reason that you're finding it really difficult is because you are not being open with your friends and colleagues and strangers when it comes to your decision to be someone who doesn't drink alcohol, you're playing the status game, right? You are trying to get your approval and your security from outside of yourself. And that will mean you are going to allow your ego to rule your life and you're not going to live as consciously as you probably want to. Okay. And at Strive, we, our goal is to live consciously and part of living consciously is being someone who doesn't drink alcohol. So we need to generate approval, security and control from within. Uh, okay. You can do this. All right. Okay. If you've got any questions whatsoever about anything that I've spoken about, um, email me at the strive method at gmail.com. If you want to join our strive community, we have a basis, basic subscription and we have an essential subscription. Email me at the strive method at gmail.com to learn more about that as well. Okay. I uh, just want to say big love and hugs to Stan. He is our producer of this podcast. He's a guy who makes me sound pretty good. And uh, Stan is currently in the Ukraine fighting the war against Russia. So Stan, we love you. Thank you very much for everything you're doing here. And thank you to everybody who's listened to this podcast and tells people about it and rates and reviews the podcast. I really, really appreciate and love you. Okay. You can do this. Strive on everybody. Much love.